mission and vision of the organization called Islami, the Islamic Society of Leading American Muslims, is to educate people about the true and peaceful message of this great religion and to encourage those who have come to this religion, whether they were born into a Muslim family or reverted or converted to this religion, to empower them and educate them and nurture them. So our culture is one of a non-judgmental, non-castigating, non-critical, non-indicting family. We are here to invite, not to indict. So we accept all people, wherever they are in their faith journey, uh, to come along for the ride with us. And once we get started and the door is closed, it's like being in a plane. Can't open the door till we land. So just kidding. But we're very happy to have you with us this morning. But that is a, a bit about what we stand for. It is part of our mission and uh, the legacy that we hope to leave behind. So in terms of prayer concerns, if any of you have prayer re requests or concerns, please post them in the chat or let me know. But we do want to pray for the Tate family in their move and uh, all of their adjustments uh, for those who are expecting uh, children in our family, mashallah. Uh, let's pray for them and pray for all of us that we can elevate our ranks as seekers of the divine in pursuit of the alchemy of happiness. In terms of announcements, on Saturday, January the 21st, um, I will be narrating, and Sister Naran is one of the actresses in the Faith Club, which will be held at Shepherd of the Hill Lutheran Church in Claremont, Florida. So this is one of our interfaith events, and we would invite you all to come, and that will be posted. And uh, Amy, um, since you haven't heard about this before, we'd love to have you. And Mason, will you put the po what time that event is in the chat? I just am not remember. I thought it was two in the afternoon, but I'm not sure about that. But um, we will post it. And uh, Amy, if you're interested in keeping up with our post, uh, May soon will connect with you and uh, get your information so that we can, uh, you will know what we're doing and, and where we're doing it, mashallah. So also the potluck will be held at our home on January the 28th, and we'll be sending out a notice to that. Uh, in this time of the year, we usually start early enough around five or so, so that we can pray Maghrib together and then have a meal and a halakha study circle. So all are invited to that. Please feel free to, we'll send out a sort of RSVP so we know how many people to cater for uh, or to be prepared for. But that will be um, Saturday, January the 28th at our home. And then on Wednesday, uh, March the 22nd, uh, everybody be reminded that we will begin the month of Ramadan. And Sunday, January the 15th, which is next Sunday, I will begin to teach about or remind you about the virtues of the sacred month, specifically the month of Rajab, which is 15 days away. So we are moving into that boot camp period to train ourselves spiritually for the month of Ramadan, which as we know is the month of abstinence. So without further ado, I think I made all of the announcements that are necessary. We will begin the class and just uh, for your sake, Amy, I will begin in Arabic, but it's just an introduction and it will be interpreted. The class will not be in Arabic, so not to worry, okay? In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'furu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. May yahdih lahu fala mudillallah wa may yu'lil fala hadiyallah wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadin abduhu rasoolu. All the praise is due to Allah. We seek Allah's help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil in our souls and from our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God, there is no deity but God, the one having no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa peace and blessings be upon him, is Allah's final slave and messenger. Ya ayyuhaladina amanu taqo laha haqqatu qatihi walla tamotunna illa wa antum muslimun. 
O you who have believed, fear Allah as Allah alone should be feared and die not except as Muslims in submission to Allah. Ya ayyuhal nasu taqu rabbakum malavi khalaqakum min nafsi wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa ba'tha min humma rijalan kathira wa nasa'a wa taqu la ladhi tasa'aluna bihi wa arham inna laha kana alaykum raqiba. O people, be dutiful to your Lord who created you from one soul and created from it its mate and dispersed from both of them many men and women. And fear Allah through whom you demand mutual rights and revere the wounds that bore you. Indeed, Allah is ever over you, Araqib, an observer. Ya yuhaladina amanu taqo laha wa kulu kaulun sadida yuslilikum amalikum wa yaqfilikum the nubukum O you who have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. Allah will then amend for you your deeds and forgive you your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and Allah's messenger has certainly attained a great attainment, the greatest bliss. So just to review just a little bit last week, we examine the need to guard our activities. We look I'm, at the origin. Imam Sox, I'm sorry for the interruption. Um, May Soon said that um, she got kicked out. Can you please let her back in? Thank I you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. There we go. Okay, let's see. Perfect. Are you back in, May Soon? I am I'm six. I'm so sorry, but if you can add me as a host, I can start adding people. I yeah, just let me, I'm, I don't, okay, let's see here. Very good. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Dr. Issa. Thank you. So last week, we examined that the origin of the human beings is the essence of the angels. And we know that souls were created before humans and souls come from the soul world, uh, which is like the angelic world, it's an unseen world. So the origin of human beings is the essence of the angels. And we looked at the marvels of the worlds of the heart. And so from this, we realize that there is another proof that there is no one who has a sound mind and sagacity, wisdom and intelligence who has not experienced the inner voice of inspiration in his or her heart. So some people occasionally I will meet them and they'll say, you know, I've just never been inspired. And I have to correct them and remind them that God said in the Holy Quran that they were inspired when their soul was introduced, before their souls were ever introduced to their mother's womb, they were inspired that there's one God. And so, um, we have experienced this in our heart, and sometimes if you think about the atheists, when they hit their finger with the hammer, they say they don't believe in God, but they say, oh my God, they immediately call on God. So we all have been born with this inspiration. It does not come from the sense of perception, the five senses, instead it appears in the very heart of mankind. And this is why, like Aristotle, Islam says that the intellect is in the heart. We must know that the heart is not of this world, but it is from the celestial world, the spiritual heart. The senses which were created for human beings for this world are necessarily a curtain between one and the celestial world. So until we can remove this curtain and be very crystal clear, have an alacrity of heart and mind, and know in no way will they ever find that way to the celestial world. So today I wanted to talk about the link of or to the kingdom of heaven. And I will be sharing what the great Imam Ghazali, may Allah be pleased with him and may Allah give him the highest levels of paradise said, do not suppose that the window of the heart to the kingdom of heaven does not open without sleep and death. That is not so. And the interdimensional meaning of this is that 
these don't have to be the only time that our soul returns to Allah. So in the Islamic paradigm, when we go to sleep, our souls are released back to Allah. And if it's Allah's will, they're returned back to us when we wake. And it reminds me of the prayer I used to say as a little boy, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray my Lord that he will take my soul. So this was a prayer that I used to pray as a child. And now as a senior <laughs> in age, um, that prayer has so much significance and meaning to me because I realized that this is a time when Allah takes my soul. But if I participate in spiritual discipline and when I awake and I remove my heart from the anger and the lust, the ill nature and the necessities of this world, and I sit in a secluded place, I close my eyes, I suspend the work of my sensory organs, I connect my heart to the Empyrean, to the divine, to the holy, to the celestial and angelic by continuously repeating praise of my Lord with my heart and not my tongue until one is aware of one's ego, unaware of one's ego and self and has no report of the entire world or of anything save Allah Most High. The window of the heart will open even though one be awake and one will still see while awake what others see only in their sleep. So we can have this safety, this tranquility, this protection from Allah when we are awake if our hearts are connected to Allah the same way that our souls are returned to Allah when we sleep. And I would call this in the modern world, perhaps spiritual mindfulness. The spirits of the angels will become visible to one in beautiful images, and one will begin to see the prophets and receive benefit and help from them. Now we may not see them, some people will see them in their dreams, but we will see them in the sense that we will study them and we will know them and we will emulate the essence of them. The kingdoms of the earth and the heavens will be shown to these people. Wonderful things beyond description will be seen by one to whom this way is open. The Prophet said, the earth was unrolled before me and I saw its father's eastern and western region. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-An'am, Surah 6 and verse 75, and thus we showed Abraham the kingdom, dominion, realm of the heavens and the earth. We showed him the ugliness and the irrationality of polytheism so that he might become one of those who would achieve or possess certainty, paqim, certainty of faith, constant certitude, certainty, and be a firm believer. So again, this word in Arabic is yaqeen. And this yaqeen, this certainty, is actually the power of iman. It is the power of faith. It is the highest level of faith in Allah, the exalted, the majestic. And it is why I keep teaching how to elevate our ranks as a seeker of the divine in pursuit of the alchemy of happiness. Because it is with this certainty that one's heart is completely aligned with the law. When we are in doubt, that is the opposite of faith. We have faith, hope, and trust on one side, doubt, worry, and fear on the other side. While other people know fear, fear cannot exist in a heart full of certainty, certainty and certitude in the law. He or she believed in Allah's protection. And he said to his companions, do not grieve. Indeed, Allah is with us. And this is in Surah Tawba, the ninth chapter of the Holy Quran in verse 40. The happiest of people in this life and in the hereafter are those who have the highest level of certainty in Allah. Exalted be Allah. With such certainty, Men and women will taste the sweetness of faith 
and the pleasure of servitude to the beneficent. It is only when certainty dwells in the heart of a slave that the doors of happiness in this life and in the hereafter are open for them. For such certainty, Allah created the heavens and the earth. There is not a sign in this universe, whether that of time and space or night and the day, but indicates certainty, certitude, taqeen, and Allah as a wajel. Prophets of Allah, his beloved ones, scholars and the wise will ask Allah for certainty, just as we are striving to elevate our ranks and to find certainty in our walk with Allah. Prophet Abraham, the friend of Allah, the wali of Allah, and we're gonna come back to that inshallah, time permitting in the class today. He said in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 260, yes, but I ask this just to reassure my heart. He asked Allah, reassure my heart. He said, have you not believed? He said, yes, but I ask this just to reassure my heart. He says, I want a higher and more perfect level, a complete level of certainty with you, O Allah. He already had certainty. He has it. But certainty of seeing and observing along with certainty of knowledge is the perfect way. And he, peace be upon him, wasn't lacking in certainty. Yaqeen, certainty again, is also the perfect knowledge of Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, of all that exists. And there's not an attribute of Allah, exalted be Allah, but the Prophet Sallallahu has firmly believed in without doubt or suspicion. And whatever of blessings he had, he perfectly believes it is from Allah. And whatever misfortune he went through, it increased his certainty, his taqleen, his certitude in Allah and in his practice, knowing for sure that Allah, his Lord, will appoint for him from the regions of the heavens and the earth a relief and a way out, no matter how difficult things were. He may see death before his eyes, and yet his certainty strengthens, his faith increases. Nothing can weaken his certainty or take him far from Allah. Yes, it is for such certainty that Allah, as a wajal, exalted be he made in fire, coolness, and safety for Ibrahim. We all know that he was thrown into the fire, and at that time the angel Jabril came to him and said, Oh, Ibrahim. Do you need anything? Ibrahim replied, this is the certainty we want. If it is from you, no. But if it is from Allah, Allah alone is sufficient for me. And he is the best disposer of affairs. Thereupon Allah said, we said, O fire, be cool and safety upon Ibrahim. So when we walk toward Allah, Allah runs toward us. And this is in Surah Al-Anbiya, Surah 21 and verse 69. It is the same certainty which, with which Moses, peace and blessings be upon him, stood in all in front of Allah. And there was this choppy sea and the enemy was behind him, in front of him, and behind him was his death. His companions were filled with fear and anxiety, the natural human emotion. The companions of Moses or Musa salam, said, we are sure to be overtaken. And this is in Ash'ura, Surah 26 and verse 61 of the Quran. Look at their expression. They were believers, but they said, we are sure to be overtaken. He said, no. He said, by no means, surely my Lord is with me. He will guide me. And this is in Surah Sha'ara, Surah 26 and verse 62. Surely my Lord is with me. Look at what his companions said. We are sure to be overtaken. And sometimes we feel that way. 
And we must be reminded that we want that kind of faith that we say, if it's from Allah, I want it. Musa salam said, my Lord is with me. He did not say, my Lord is with us. He said, my Lord is with me. He had that certainty. Thereupon Allah said, then when he, when he validated, when he spoke into being that faith, that unshakable man, Allah said in the next verse, in verse 63, then we inspired to Musa, strike with your staff the sea, and each portion was like a great towering mountain. MashaAllah, when that sea parted by Allah, the, the water stood like mountains. Allah. <laughs> this verse begins with the conjunction fact, which in the Arabic language indicates immediate follow up. One of our sheikhs, may Allah have mercy on him, said by Allah immediately after Moses said, surely my Lord is with me. He will guide me. It was revealed to him that strike with your staff, the sea. And it parted and each portion was like a towering mountain. The sea became like the huge firm mass of a mountain. The sea was parted, turning into dry land for them. As Allah commanded the sea to dry and the highways to stop. So Allah, as the Wajal ordered, and they immediately obeyed his order. Certainty is the power of faith in Allah, the exalted, the majestic. With such certainty, one's heart is completely aligned with Allah, as the Wajal. While all other people know fear, Fear cannot exist in a heart full of certainty. So we ask Allah to give us certainty of faith. He believed in Allah's protection. And he said to his companions, do not grieve. Indeed, Allah is with us. And this is in Surah Tawbah, verse 40. Look at what Musa said. Surely my Lord is with me. And when we are going through those valleys of life, let it be that we say, surely Allah is with me. My children may not be believing. I may be struggling to find shelter. I may be struggling financially. I may be struggling in a relationship. The beauty of this is, we look at Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. Our beloved Lord said to him, do not grieve, indeed Allah is with us. But here to his companion, the Prophet Sallallahu didn't say indeed Allah is with me. Because Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had complete certainty in Allah, the exalted, the almighty. So Abu Bakr, radiallahu on, this great companion of the Prophet Wasallam's migration to Allah and leaving behind his wealth, his family and his children are proofs of certainty. The verse, but those most devoted to Allah shall be removed far from it, hell, those who spend their wealth to purify themselves. And this is in Surah Layl, Surah 92, verse 18. And it was revealed regarding him. He was Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. His faith, certainty, and servitude to Allah, his Lord, are beyond compare. He was content with Allah as his Lord, Islam as his religion, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his messenger. He was Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, the companion of the ummah who bore the burden of this ummah and felt sad and disturbed for his ummah. The one companion of our beloved prophet whose wives and 
children and their children, three generations embraced Islam, the only one. All doors of the Prophet Solomon's masjid were closed except his door, this door. His had excellent qualities and virtues that no one else had from among the companions of the Prophet Solomon. He is best of this ummah after its prophet for the certainty Salam in Allah dwelled in his heart. When a servant reaches such a rank, such level of perfect certainty, it becomes visible in his or her testifying Allah's oneness and sincere devotion to Allah, exalted be Allah. You then find in him or her in these people in his or her worship and servitude to Allah than sincerest among people. They have a class, they have sincerity in their worship. It is these people that never turn away from Allah. When afflicted with calamities, they don't turn to foretellers or astrologers, but rather they turn to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds as Allah made him independent of all those besides him. It is certainty that makes him a true servant to Allah and not to anything else. And when a favor is bestowed upon them, you find them among the most grateful to Allah, amongst those who remember Allah often in fear of Allah's meeting and hope for his reward. In his heaven and earth, everything in this universe leads you to certainty. Does every passing moment in your life increase your faith in Allah? I wonder how many people glorify this worldly life, its physical assets and means, and rarely glorify the Lord of the worlds, the God of those of old and those of latter times. Imam Ghazali points out that all the prophets, peace and blessings be upon him, were in this state. Indeed, all the knowledge of the prophets came in this way, not by means of the census or academic instruction. It is this certainty, this certitude that is the beginning of all striving to elevate our ranks as seekers of the divine in pursuit of the alchemy of happiness. As Allah glorified and exalted says in Surah Al-Muzammil, Surah 73, verse 8, always remember the name of thy Lord and devote yourself to Allah wholeheartedly with a complete and perfect devotion. When we have a complete and perfect devotion, we will have certitude we will have certainty in the way of gnosis, in the way of experiential knowledge. And this means that we must separate ourselves, sort of sanctify ourselves from all created things, not make them our gods, and give ourselves to Allah. Men and jinn were born for naught except to worship Allah. So I encourage you, don't concern yourself with the arrangements of this world. We have to live in it. For Allah promised us that he will manage our affairs. In Surah Al-Muzammil, verse 9, chapter 73, verse 9, he is the Lord of the East and of the West. There is no God worthy of worship except God. So take God alone as the trustee of affairs. Who could have a better trustee than Allah? When we take Allah as a wajel, when we take God as our protector, become unencumbered by the world and do not mix too much with those people who are committed to the world unnecessarily we will find ourselves with our Lord. After all these many nine billion people of the world, they have a lot to say and each one of them has opinions. 
And we're reminded in verse 10 of that chapter and be patient over what they say and avoid them with gracious avoidance. Just be patient. In another place, it says in the Quran, say peace to the ignorant. All of this is instruction in spiritual discipline and striving. This is the way of those who wish to elevate their ranks as seekers of the divine, and this is the way of the prophets. On the other hand, acquiring knowledge by means of academic learning is the way of religious scholars, and this too is great, but it is trivial in comparison with the knowledge of the prophets and the rightly guided predecessors and saints or elevated believers which come to the hearts from the divine presence without an intermediary or the instruction of human beings. And let me say, because I said that word saint, that inshallah I'll get to that today, we do not worship saints in Islam, but there is this spirit of sainthood that exists, but it means something different. We do not worship them. We only worship Allah. The correctness of this way has been shown to many people, but through experience, we talk about gnosis, experiential knowledge of Allah and Allah's message, and also by intellectual proof. And as many of you know, the way that I came to this religion, my first experience was very spiritual. In 1982, I believe it was when I was arriving in South Africa, I heard the Adhan and I'd never heard it before. And I began to cry. That was a spiritual, it was an unseen experience. And then I read for about seven years, in 19, five years, in 1987, I did my Shahada. It was based on an intellectual reading and understanding of this great religion, having not been exposed to any Muslim. If you're not able to acquire this, either by means of experience or reason, then at least believe in it and attest to it. At least we deprive, be deprived of all levels of belief, of faith. And these are among the marvels of the worlds of the heart. And through them, the nobility of human self is made manifest. You see, my beloved brothers and sisters, I remind myself and I remind you and something that I often repeat is that the human being is born with an innate nature. And this innate nature calls them to Allah. This innate nature is the God infusion that God gave us when he put our souls into our mother's womb. Do not suppose that this is restricted to the prophets. May Allah be pleased with all of them. The essence of all persons in their original nature is fit for this. So it's available for all of us. Just as there is no iron in its original nature unsuited for the making of a mirror, because mirrors in the old days were iron that was made shiny so you could get a reflection. But that mirror was easily contaminated if some kind of toxicity got on it. It would corrode it. And then you would not be able to see clearly the same way that in the beautiful mirrors of today, if we get smoke on them or dust, we will not be able to see clearly. In the same way, every heart that has been overcome by the worldly greed and appetite for sins, which have become firmly established in it, when people are certainty of these practices to the point of being possessed by them and assuming their nature nullifies this potential suitability. All of us were born with this innate nature, calling us to one God. Allah Most High has spoken of the generality of this capacity when he said in Surah Al-Araf, Surah 7, verse 172, and mentioned when your Lord took from the children of Adam, from their loins, their descendants, and made them test their descendants for these souls and made them testify saying, am I not your Lord? They said, yes, these are the souls speaking. 
we have testified this least ye should say on the day of erection indeed we were unaware we were born with the seed of belief it is as basic as answering to every sane person who asks is two not greater than one and indeed we know that this is correct even though all persons possessing the faculty of reason may not have heard or uttered this truth all his or her instincts are replete with this knowledge of Allah. Some might say subconsciously. The innate nature of all human beings is the same as that. The knowledge of the divine is also in their innate nature. Our creator most high said in Surah Luqman, Surah 31, verse 25. If thou shouldest ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would surely say, God, Allah, all praise is due to Allah. But most of them are unaware. In Surah Arum, the Romans, Surah 30, verse 30. So direct your face toward the religion inclining to truth. Adhere to the fitra the nature of Allah upon which Allah has created all people. No change should there be in the creation of Allah. This is the correct religion, but most people do not know. So Allah reminds us, you were born perfect. You came, 85% of people came out of their mother's womb, bowing down in prostration and sujood to God. And God said, don't let there be any change in this. So with the proofs of reason, experience, it is plain that this capacity is not restricted to prophets. For the prophets were also mortals. They were human beings. Allah Most High said to the prophets, Allah was Solomon, verse 118, Sorry, chapter 18, verse 110. Say, I am only a mortal man like you to whom has been revealed that your God is one God. So whoever would hope for the meeting with his or her Lord, let him or her do righteous work and not associate in the worship of his Lord anyone or anything created. However, as for the person to whom this way has been opened, if it is good for the people, it is for the good of the people. All is shown to him or her, and then he or she invites them to it. What has been shown him or her is called the religious law, the sarat al-mustakim, the right way, the straight path. And who called them to that were messengers. And for all of the messengers that is a Mu'ajizah, prophets were given this special gift of miracle. So you could say that their condition is miraculous. If he does not engage in inviting the people, then he is a believer inviting the people. And his or her state is that of one committed to God, surrendering to God, and in the grammatical sense, Muslim, the doer of peace. If he or she does not engage in inviting all the people, he is still called a believer. And his or her state is that of one who is submitted to Allah. It is not necessary that everyone in whom the state is seen be involved in the propagation of faith. We know that the early believers practiced their faith in secret for three years before they could pray publicly because of their persecution. Accordingly, you must have a proper belief in what it is to be a believer and the righteous works of the believers. Know too that the beginning of this work depends upon the greater struggle, the struggle between the ego and the spirit, the ruh, 
the spitra. Not everyone who sows reaps. Not everyone who travels arrives. And not everyone who seeks finds. The more precious a thing is, the more numerous the conditions and the rarer its attainment. These are the more noble of the degrees for a human being at the station of experiential knowledge of practice, pursuing it without strenuous effort and without an experienced mature guide is very difficult. Someone has to teach us. Someone has to give us the proper adab, the proper etiquettes and manners, the proper approach, the proper understanding. If these two qualities are present, he or she still will not teach, will not reach, I'm sorry, his or her goal without the aid of divine grace. And until his or her destiny decrees the spiritual happiness for him or her. This is the way to achieve the level of leadership and the external knowledge and in all voluntary actions. I'm going to speak today, inshallah, about the nobility of the heart through this power of certainty the power of a man. As you have come to know one exemplar of the nobility of the human essential nature, that which is called the heart in the way of experiential knowledge, know, know now that there is also a nobility from power. I'm not talking about usurp power. It too is an angelic quality, not found in animals. It is this that in the same way that the world of physical bodies is subject to the angels so that when at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command, they deem it appropriate and they see that man needs it, they bring to mankind what they need. This is a group, there is a group of angels that are responsible for certain tasks, like the bringing of the wind and the bringing of the rain. Allah orders them and they orchestrate these things by the shah and the will of Allah. The human spirit, for it shares the essence of the angels, has also been given the power to subject some of the physical bodies of the world to itself but in a beautiful and eloquent way. Can also be, unfortunately, in a way that's not so beautiful and eloquent. Every person's private world is his or her physical body, and the body is supposed to be made subservient to Allah. Its extremities are supposed to surrender and do what Allah wanted them to do, not what the ego wants them to do. So if my heart is filled with the inspiration of God, if my heart is filled with the right knowledge, it will command that my hands only do that which pleases the law. And we know that the hand is representative of power. My tongue will only speak that which Allah would have it speak. My ears will only listen to that which Allah would have it listen to. My eyes will only look at that which Allah would have it look at and my feet will only walk in the places that Allah would have me walk. It is evident that the heart is not in the finger, nor our knowledge and will, but when the heart commands it, the finger moves at the heart's command, and hopefully that heart is filled with the knowledge of Allah. When the image of anger appears in the animal soul, sweat pours out from the seven limbs as though it were rain. When the image of carnal appetite appears in the heart, the instrument of carnality swells. And we want to satisfy the ego's desires, the animal part of ourself. It is no secret that the control of the spirit, the ruh, the fitra through the body, and that the body is subjected to the spirit. What kind of spirits do we possess? What kind of spirits do we manifest and materialize in that context 
in our daily lives. It may us be understood that it is proper that some spirits nobler and stronger, nearer to and more resembling the angelic essence Those are the kind of spirits that obey Allah. And as a result, things become subjected to them only by the shah of Allah. It is these kind of people that sometimes by the shah of Allah, when they pray for someone, they improve. When someone is anxious and they come to them, they find peace, serenity, tranquility, rest and repose. When he or she forms the thought about a person, for that person to come near them, suddenly they connect. If this particular person of this certitude of faith prays for rain, it rains. All of this is possible with intellectual proof and is evident through experience. Sometimes we call this influence. In Islam, we have something known as the evil eye. And that which is called sorcery are of this kind and are the effects of a person's spirit on the bodies of others. So that should they or their spirit be mean and envious, he or she sees something they desire and because they are jealous of it, it can be cursed. This is what I mean by the power. Probably all of you have seen in your life the destructive power of someone who is jealous, what it can do to another human being. If such a quality also marvels of the power of what's in one's heart and what it can manifest. If such a special quality as this appears in a person, if he or she is one who calls people to faith, then they perhaps, they are believers. They are convicted Muslims. If these are for good deeds, then the one who performs them are called sometimes saints. And there are people, I'm gonna deviate for a moment, but there are people among Muslims that will say, we do not believe in saints. We do not believe in saints that are worshipped. That is true. But I want to share some verses with you to enlighten you about the hallmark of Aliya. The word we use for saints in Arabic are wali. And if you are a Muslim, you are a wali of Allah. And it has different ranks, different stations. Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah 2 and verse 257, Allah is the wali of those who believe, those who have faith. He brings them out from darknesses, not just one darkness, but darknesses into the light. And in Surah 4, Anasai verse 45, Allah alone is the believer's wali, ally, guardian, protector, helper, and friend. Allah has full knowledge of your enemies and Allah is sufficient as a protector and Allah is sufficient as a help. The beauty of the word wali is that it is on a pattern which is both active and passive. Allah as a wajel is the active wali and tawali is the passive wali. It means someone who is protected, but it also means an ally. Are we allies to Allah and Allah's cause? If we give Allah victory, Allah will give us victory. If we fight in Allah's cause, Allah will aid us in this world. The word in Arabic for saints 
is from holy. In Latin, comes from sanctity or holiness. In our tradition, we say of great scholars, katutu sarahu, may Allah sanctify his soul. So we do have this concept. So we have this concept of the sanctified soul, the soul that is set apart just to worship Allah, to bring people this way. So in that way, again, we do believe in saints, but we do not worship them. There are people in our community that say, again, there are no saints, but this is not true. The hallmark of a true religion is that it can produce saints. It can produce a saint. If it can't, can it be a true religion? These distinguished servants of Allah have a rahma. They have a mercy for people. They really care about the plight of human beings. And the Prophet Sallallahu when Allah chose to define his own nature, he said, this is a prophet that came as a mercy to all mankind. A rahma. He could have said he came as a judger and avenger of those who were unjust. But no, he said he came as a mercy to all mankind, not just believers, but all mankind. He could have said at the beginning of every chapter in the Quran except Surah Toba. Instead of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah, the merciful and the compassion. He could have said in the name of Allah, the avidger of those who do not stand with me. But he didn't say that. These believers or saints have universal compassion. They don't just care about humans, but they care about the planet. They care about the rivers. They care about the plants, they care about animals. One of the things about these people, these extraordinary exemplars, is that they give you the gift of total acceptance. The Prophet Sallallahu treated the alcoholics of the Arabian nation when he arrived there as a prophet with open acceptance. All were invited to come in the state that they were in as alcoholics reciting their poetry in a Kaaba surrounded by 360 idols at that time, one for every day of the year. It's also interesting to note that our beloved prophet did not have disciples. He had companions, not muridun, but asab. And this is so beautiful. And I only recently really got an interdimensional meaning of this word. He called the people that would come after him, us. He did not call us Asab. He called us his brothers and sisters. He said, Ikhwani. And his companion said, Ya Rasulullah, aren't we your brothers and sisters? He said, no, my brothers and sisters come after me. They're the ones that won't see me and won't sit with me, but they will believe. He said they would do anything just to see me. The companions had the blessing to see and sit with our beloved Rasulullah They were his companions. The Prophet said, if I were going to take a friend, it would have been Abu Bakr. This extraordinary companionship is what saints offer. They talk about just sitting and keeping company because that is a transformative event for the people who are gifted with the presence of those people is just sitting in their company. I deem by a law that I met just a few of these people in my life and just to sit in their company and to feel the sense that they have separated themselves. Yes, they function in the world, but it's 
a means to an end. Once I heard Sheikh Hamza Yusuf say that when you sit with these people, there is a chemical transformation that will happen. Often when you are with these people, you may feel elated sometimes and you may feel restricted because you become aware of how weak we might be and what is available to us that we have not strived to get to. It is uncommon, but they could be unlettered shepherds or people that Allah gifted with knowledge. Generally, though, these people are scholarly people. They have studied extensively, especially in their youth, which reminds me that it is said that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus said, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. One of the great so-called saints of Islam said, if you see me leave one sunnah, leave me. This is what they embody. But most importantly, what we must realize is our intention. And let it be our intention that we will strive to elevate our ranks as seekers of the divine that we will strive to be beacons of light in our communities, that we will strive to be examples of these prophets that we have studied and that we have got to know. Please know that I love you all for the sake of Allah, as a wajal. And there is much to say on this, but given the time restraints of the day and my respect for your time. I end with subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu Allah ilaha ila anta. Astaghfaruka wa atubu ilayk. Transcended on you, O Allah. And praise be to you as you praise yourself. I bear witness that there is no deity save you. I seek your forgiveness and I repent to you. O oh Allah, grant us good in this world and good in the hereafter. And save us, O oh Allah, from the chastisement of the fire. O oh Allah, lay not on us a burden greater than we have strength to bear. Bought out our sins and grant us forgiveness. Have mercy on us, O oh Allah, thou art our protector. Thou art our wali. Help us against those who stand against thee. O oh Allah, let not our hearts deviate now after thou hast guided us. For grant us mercy from thine own presence, for thou art the grantor of bounty without limit. Amen.